Okay. Um, so I'm going to do my best to have those quizzes graded um, so that you get it back on Wednesday. And I'll put the score into the gradebook on Blackboard. Now, I haven't yet started dropping the homework assignment grades, because if you enable that before there's very many assignments, then it just says that you have no grades. So you've got to have at least a couple of homework assignments in there. Otherwise, it, it just does weird things when you drop the, uh, the homework assignment that will be dropped. Um, now, the three reservoirs homework is due on Wednesday of this week. Remember, that's just two problems. Both of them are related to a three reservoir question. And so if you have any difficulty with that, stop by and let me know. I'd be happy to go over it with you. Uh, the other thing that we're going to do today, besides the quiz, is uh, revisit a question that came to you in homework number one. And this is one where uh, I was kind of surprised that so many people struggled with it. And so since we have a little bit of leeway today, um, we're going to, that's not the one I want to open. <coughs> okay. Jeez Louise, that's not the right one. Okay, I've got a handout for you. It's the Moody Diagram and uh, question seven from homework number one. So we're going to go through it uh, together. Actually, I'd like you to get in groups. And so, Jeffrey, can you scoot back a couple of rows so that you're working with your classmates on that third row? All right, so you've got to be in groups of two or three. And uh, I'd like us to all work through this together so that we agree on where on the Moody diagram these important intersection points are. All right, so <coughs> with this problem, at the, at the bottom is the problem statement. Let me go to that here. Okay, so we know the uh, water's kinematic viscosity is given. We know that it's a cast iron pipe where the um, equivalent sand roughness is defined. We have the diameter of the pipe. And so with the equivalent sand roughness and the diameter, of course, we'll be able to figure out which of these curves we're going to follow on the right vertical axis. And then we don't have the velocity or the flow rate defined, but we do know uh, the travel time. And so with this travel time and the distance, that's where you're going to get the V. And uh, I think each of you already know the formula for the Reynolds number. You proved that during the quiz. Nobody took the bait and asked for the assistance to know the Reynolds number. All right. So we got the Reynolds number formula. So that will be our horizontal axis, and so we're looking for the point of intersection that defines the friction factor. Okay, so water's flowing through a pipe. What's the uh, Reynolds number? We can get the Reynolds number. Uh, we have to have the velocity. So now velocity times diameter divided by kinematic viscosity. The Reynolds number is miraculously 30,000, which makes it awfully convenient because if we go to the Moody diagram, that's one of the curves that we can follow is this 3 times 10 to the fourth. Now, it's a common mistake that people are looking to the right rather than looking to the left. And so the way to remember it is if this is 1 times 10 to the 4th, then 2 times 10 to the 4th, 3 times 10 to the 4th. So 9 times 10 to the 4th is 
um, what, 90,000, and then 10 times 10 to the fourth is 100,000, or 1 times 10 to the fifth. So it's building up in value to the right. It's increasing. So 3 times 10 to the fourth. I think a good habit, if you actually have the paper diagram, is to draw a pencil line upward on that all the way up through the diagram so that you can find the point of intersection. And the, uh, the other point of intersection that we're going to use is if we go back here to uh, the relative roughness. So 0 0.002. Now with 0 0.002 that means we're right on this curve and we're going over until we find that vertical intersection. And so the 3 times 10 to the 4th and the curve intersect right here. And so if this is 0 0.029, it looks like it's halfway between 0 0.029 and 0 0.028. And so I estimated that it is 0 0.0285. And then I gave some instructions to the grader about what's the acceptable range. Uh, I was probably a little too generous there on what the acceptable range is because, I mean, it's very clearly above 0 0.028 and not halfway to the middle between these two. Um, all right, so now you got the idea of what if our relative roughness had been 0 0.003. We don't have the curve for 0 0.003. So what do you do in a case like that? Well, you try and maintain equidistance between the 0 0.04 curve and the 0 0.02 curve. And so on the printout you've got, try and find out what would have been the friction factor with the Reynolds number of the same, the 30,000. And so that same line going up through the 30,000. And instead of having the exact intersection with the 0 0.02 curve, try and estimate what would it be for the uh, 0 0.003. So it's going to be halfway between where those two curves are. All right, I've got my guess. Mm -hmm. Let me write my guess on the board. We'll see if, if you agree. So the F value would be 0 0.031. What if I do 3 of 5? <laughs> oh, may, gee, maybe I got it wrong. 3, oh, I got it wrong this time. Let's see. Minus 2 points for Gryffindor. It's actually minus like, way between half of a thousand, something like that. Half of a thousand points for Gryffindor. Yeah, it's probably 0.0305, right? 305? So it would be halfway between the 0 0.02 curve. So we're looking on the 3. OK, so it's halfway between here and here. So it's right about there. So that's the approach. You approximate distance between curves. And you have to be pretty careful if it's this uh, logarithmic scale of Reynolds number. Makes it tricky. Oh, I know. All right. Now, the uh, other thing I wanted to do with our remaining time is um, look briefly at the homework assignment, the three reservoirs assignment for problem one. I'm going to suggest a slightly improved version of the spreadsheet. Um, what you can do is use the fully turbulent flow assumption rather than just a guess value of F. Um, you can calculate F based on the fully turbulent flow assumption. And I think I mentioned this to you on Friday, what the fully turbulent flow assumption is. Does anybody remember what you're assuming when you invoke the fully turbulent flow assumption? Um, that the Reynolds value gets higher, and so it makes that fraction on the right side of the um, massive log go uh, to a limit of zero. Exactly right. That's perfect. Yep. So if the Reynolds number is really high, meaning there's a high velocity through the pipe, then the F value only depends on this term. So if the Reynolds number is big enough, then that right-hand side just goes to nothing. And so that's something that allows us to estimate the F value in a first iteration without knowing what's the flow velocity and the flow rate. 
And uh, the reason why we don't know the flow rate is because in the three reservoirs problem, we have to kind of uh, start with this guess. We don't know the F values. We don't know the head loss through the pipes and so on. So that's the first suggestion I have is using the fully turbulent flow assumption. The other thing is you can improve on the F value between steps. You know, you have some initial value of your F value, which in iteration one, you're calculating based on the uh, fully turbulent flow assumption. But then once you have your V value, velocity, which is just from rearranging the Darcy-Wiesbach equation, now that you know an implied velocity, you can calculate the Reynolds number. And now you can have a new F value. We're using the full Jane equation rather than just the... Uh, um, the fully turbulent flow assumption. So this initial F is improved upon with the new F. And um, I'm calculating like a percent change as an indicator of whether the solution has converged. Like we want the, uh, the in and the out to be equal, but we also want the F value not to be changing anymore. So you could do a goal seek with the first iteration and try and force the in and the out to be equal, but since the F values hadn't yet converged, you wouldn't have the correct head and the correct flow rates. And so that's why we can't just do a goal seek in the first iteration. We have to actually copy and paste this for subsequent iterations, is that we're fine-tuning two things at once. We're fine-tuning our guess value for what is the head at D, then we're also fine-tuning the guess of the F value through the pipes. And so the suggestion I have is, you know, have your initial F, a new F value, and then calculating the percent change between your first F and the updated F. Any questions about that? Or any questions in general about this procedure? Do I remember correctly that it, that was a recorded lecture, the one where you first got three reservoirs? Yeah. yeah. I just don't have as much confidence as those recorded lectures because we didn't go through it together and I don't know if you have questions and so. I'm not sure what you mean by if then. I know in the lectures you emphasize the importance of like flow direction. Oh, this? Yeah, and then oh. like the conclusion. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So um, how to interpret whether it's, you know, what to make of a positive error versus a negative error. And so here, okay. um, so the guess value is too high. So how do we know the guess value is too high? All right, so I made a guess for what's the head at this junction. And think about if the head at the junction is too high, then that means there's going to be less flow in than there is flow out. And let's see if that was the case here. If we have um, the sum of those two things is 0.11, there's um, the flow out is greater than the flow in. So what would make the, uh, the flow out would be larger if, if there's lots of energy at D, then that's going to mean a more of a driving force from D towards C. And so the fact that there's more out than in means that my guess was too high. Whereas if I had made an initial guess that like there's very little uh, head at D, so if, if maybe I had assumed 655, then that means there's going to be very little driving force from the junction, the energy at the junction, through this pipe to reservoir C. And so if my guess is too low, then that's going to give you where there's more flow into the junction than there is flow out of the junction. So that would be kind of the opposite here. So the interpretation is if you have a positive error where out is positive and in is negative, then the guess is too high. But if you had a negative error, then your guess would be too low. So let me see if I force that head guess to be 655, what would it do? So 655, and it updates all this. So if I even did an if-then statement, that's pretty nerdy. Um, so it, here, what it's saying is, uh, if this is positive, then that means the guess is too high. Otherwise, the else being if it's negative, then the guess 
is too low. So now I can't just keep playing around with this guess and you know like try and find it. I can't do a what if. Let me show you because sometimes students are tempted. You're so used to goal seeking. So we, our goal is that we want this to be zero, but I can't just achieve it by changing that. And the reason why it's not enough is that the F values are still changing. So my initial F, my final F, the F values aren't fully converged yet. So I have to do that thing where I copy and paste into uh, the next iteration. All right, so that's a good question about how to interpret the in and the out. Like, how do you know if your guess was too high or too low? The main way to assess that is just think about you know, the head at D is all about how much energy is there at D. And if there's a lot of energy at D, if the head is really high, then there won't be much of a driving force to move the water from reservoir B and A towards that junction. And that's why you'd have very little flow coming into the junction, but then a lot of flow going out. Okay, so that's it for today. Remember that if you uh, want a free meal or are interested in an internship, you can stop by and hear the DOH presentation this afternoon at 5 p.m. Otherwise, the homework three is due on Wednesday, and feel free to stop by if you have any questions. I'd be happy to help you out with that.